This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Shivra Roy from the University of Washington. And today's Neurology Podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Monica Lee. Monica is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the Boston University School of Medicine, and she's a clinical neuropsychologist at Boston Medical Center. Her recent research at the BU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy Center has been at the intersection of head injury, aging, and psychiatric disorders. Today, we're going to dive into Monica's article on exactly that topic published in Neurology titled Association of Vascular Risk Factors and CSF and Imaging Biomarkers with White Matter Hyperintensities in Former American Football Players. Monica, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me on. It's a pleasure. Well, I just want to just dive right in, and especially when we talk about the challenges of diagnosing CTE or other neurodegenerative disease related to repetitive head impacts, there's been this lack of biomarkers in the place of confirmatory pathology obtained at autopsy. Could you describe to us the landscape of our understanding of existing imaging biomarkers and how they related to repetitive head impacts, especially before this study? We have yet to find a specific biomarker or set of biomarkers for the diagnosis of CTE in living people, although research is certainly ongoing. We do know that people with exposure to repetitive head impacts, which is the primary risk factor for CTE, they tend to have smaller medial temporal and subcortical volumes and cortical thinning in multiple areas. They also tend to show abnormalities in the white matter, which can be seen on diffusion tensor imaging or on T2 flare imaging as white matter hyperintensities. But all of these findings are fairly nonspecific. That is to say, we have yet to identify a pattern that we can say is a unique consequence of repetitive head impacts. And so what motivated you to specifically look at this association, especially at T2 hyper intensities in the white matter, and particularly in the population of former football players? Well, it's likely that the constellation of symptoms experienced by people with exposure to repetitive head impacts is driven by multiple pathologies, not just the characteristic P-tau in CTE. So it made sense for us to look at white matter. If you think of the mechanical result of a head impact, the white matter in this brain is undergoing this shearing or tearing force that can then disrupt connectivity. So we previously found that people with repetitive head impacts have more of these T2 flare white matter hyperintensities that are actually related to their cognitive problems and their worst daily functioning. We're specifically looking at former football players as a primary research group because of its popularity and its publicity in U.S. culture, and also because it's relatively easier in this group to quantify the cumulative exposure to repetitive head impacts in terms of years or seasons of play, or even more recently with helmet accelerometer studies, a quantitative measure of the cumulative exposure. You really couldn't have teed me up better for for my next question, which is just to dive into this study. Could you take us through the design and are there any particular strengths that you want to highlight? So this study looked at 180 former American football players and associations between white matter hyperintensities in their brains and multiple other potential risk factors and biomarkers such as vascular health, cerebral spinal fluid markers of amyloid, tau, and inflammation, and MRI markers of white matter integrity and neurodegeneration. And then we then compared these associations to a control group of asymptomatic men who had no exposure to repetitive head impacts or traumatic brain injury. I would say a strength of this study was that we were able to look at CSF biomarkers, neuroimaging, and vascular risk simultaneously all at once, because of the richness of our data set in these football players. 
That certainly stood out to me. I work myself as a neuroimmunologist and and certainly doing any sort of research where we can regularly obtain uh, cerebrospinal fluid is remarkable to me and hats off to all of you and being able to do that. So what were your results? We found that in these former football players, white matter hyperintensities were related to greater vascular risk, higher CSFP tau, lower white matter integrity on diffusion tensor imaging, and reduced cortical thickness. But these relationships were not present to an appreciable degree in the control group. So these results suggest that the relationships with white matter hyperintensities could be specific to the consequences of repetitive head impacts, as opposed to what we might expect with normal aging. We also found that white matter hyperintensities in the former football players were not related to CSF amyloid. So these relationships could show a different pattern from what we might expect to see in Alzheimer's disease. And one thing that you mentioned earlier, but stood out to me, was that you also had certain thresholds in how long the former football players had played. And so if they had played professionally, they had either played at least four years or those who had played in college had had played at least three years. And of course, understood within that is that they certainly played football in the years before those levels. So how did you determine those thresholds and, and why are those important? Our group previously found that there's a dose response relationship between the years of football played and CTE risk with a sort of threshold around five years of organized football play and then much more substantial risk when you go past 11 years of football play. So we were looking at these former elite athletes so that we could discern the clearest differences between people with exposure to repetitive head impacts versus those without. Understood. And did you find specific changes when you were stratifying for level of play? Yeah, we sure did. We found that the relationship between more white matter hyperintensities and lower white matter integrity on diffusion tensor imaging was stronger in the former college football players versus the controls, but it was strongest in the former professional football players. So again, we're seeing this kind of dose-response relationship based on level of play. Well, we'll certainly dig into that in a moment here. I wanted to just briefly ask you, obtain CSF biomarkers, which is quite impressive in my mind. How did you determine which CSF biomarkers you wanted to investigate here? And how did those end up being reflected in the modeling? Here we really drew upon the Alzheimer's disease literature and the traumatic brain injury literature to see which CSF and neuroimaging markers were commonly investigated in relation to white matter hyperintensities. We also drew upon our autopsy, our brain bank studies in our repetitive head impact groups to look at any antemortem associations with CSF biomarkers. In this study, we modeled it so that most of the risk factors and biomarkers are leading to white matter hyperintensities. And then white matter hyperintensities lead to neurodegeneration in the form of cortical thinning. But we really think that a lot of these relationships are probably bidirectional. I guess what I'm really taking away is that it does seem that when we compare folks who have had repetitive head injury, especially those playing football versus essentially healthy controls, we certainly see multiple risk factors and and multiple markers in those that are still living based on both imaging as well as CSF biomarkers and and vascular biomarkers that suggest that they have worse brain health. And there is a toll that seems to be taken with this repetitive head injury. What's interesting is the idea that we may be able to better identify folks who are at risk of the development of CTE while they're still living. But I was wondering, could you clarify that for us? What do you think these results change in terms of being able to identify those patients who are at risk? I think with these results, we're starting to broaden the picture to not just look at PTAU in terms of CTE, but also consider these other pathologies and these other relationships between the multiple pathologies. And these results also take us one step closer to finding 
patterns in markers that could be specific to CTE in order to distinguish it from the effects of other neurodegenerative diseases. Based off these results, how should we advise patients who are identified to have a history of repetitive head trauma, particularly the risk factors that you've identified? You know, how should this alter clinical practice? As a clinician, I would treat this similarly to other risk factors that put patients at risk for cognitive impairment or dementia in that we want to intervene at the levels that we can. In this particular group, we know that white matter hyperintensities are related to greater vascular risk. And for these football players, treating obstructive sleep apnea addressing heavy alcohol use, and of course, managing their chronic medical conditions like hypertension or high cholesterol is going to make a big difference. And like many of our other patients, we would be promoting healthy lifestyle habits, optimizing their sleep, their nutrition, and their exercise as well. What place do you think obtaining imaging holds in clinical practice for these folks now? I wouldn't be rushing in to get an MRI if you just had a history of organized sports, but you don't have any or you have minimal symptoms because, again, there's no surefire pattern from the MRI that'll tell us your risk of developing CTE. But, of course, if you have a patient that's coming in with progressive cognitive or behavioral decline, I think it's pretty common to at least consider imaging to help with differential diagnosis. Obviously, like I said, I'm a neuroimmunologist. I I evaluate people for MS. And so I'm referred folks with abnormal MRIs all the time. And so I'm the first to know that, hey, you know, there's obviously many, many different conditions that can cause white matter hyperintensities that can be nonspecific. I guess what that leads me into is with these findings, are there any sort of caveats or confounders that we might need to keep in mind when considering the results? Yeah, that's a great point that these white matter hyperintensities are definitely nonspecific. And I am not by any means saying that they are a biomarker specifically for repetitive head impacts or CTE. We know that they're super common. They pop up more as we age normally. And even though we've traditionally thought of them as reflecting cerebral small vessel disease, we know they can play different roles in different diseases And now we can start to look more at their location and distribution to get more information. In terms of other caveats, I'll say we still need more research at other forms of repetitive head impacts. So beyond American football, we need to look at other contact sports. We need to definitely do more research in women in the military. And that could even extend to victims of intimate partner violence. I want to take a step even further back, maybe take a, you know, the look at the 50,000 foot view of where we are with the evaluation of young athletes and their risk of CTE. I know even your institution had released a study, I think early last year that really stuck with me, which was that 92% of the brains that they had examined had pathologic findings of CTE. And, you know, perhaps there's some selection bias there, but it was still quite striking to me. And we're here in the midst of the NFL playoffs, and it feels like every year we hear actually even less about CTE and repetitive hit impact. As we consider the results of your study, as we consider the results of prior work, how do we as neurologists apply this in terms of counseling either parents or young athletes themselves as they participate in contact sports, especially in the prevention of the development of CTE? You know, I realize that's a big question, but I think a lot of us are, are eager to know. I think the best thing that we can do as clinicians is to help educate our patients about the latest that we know on CTE and the effects of repetitive head impacts. So even though we don't know the exact prevalence of CTE in anyone who's played any organized contact sport, we do know that the longer that you play in these contact sports, the greater the risk of having cognitive and psychiatric consequences later in life even if you're looking and doing just fine in young adulthood. At that point with your patient, it becomes kind of a personal decision 
on how far or whether to continue engaging in these activities. And it becomes kind of a values-based conversation. I'll also say that our role as scientists as well is to spread the word about the effects of repetitive head impacts and see if we can make a difference at more like an institutional or a cultural level to see if as a society, can we maybe pull back from normalizing or even reveling in the hard collisions that are so common in contact sports? That's an incredibly valuable advice. And I think one that will resonate. You mentioned some of the future populations that you might want to investigate, but based on these results, what else are you interested in investigating when it comes to this work in the future? I'm really interested to keep honing in on specificity when it comes to identifying the effects of repetitive head impacts in life. So finding out not only what biomarkers, but also what clinical features set these individuals apart from, say, early onset Alzheimer's disease or frontal temporal dementia or even post-traumatic stress disorder. So that when these patients walk into my clinic and tell me about their symptoms, I have a better idea of what's going on and can tease it apart a bit better. Monica, I can't thank you enough for your time. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology specific topics you want to learn about.